This is Larry Levine. You're watching After Hours. This evening we have a special guest, uh, Earl Bruce. Hi, Larry. How you doing? Really good. Well, I'm doing good, too. Good. This is uh, the time of year you're, uh, well, not really relaxing, but you're getting prepared for next year. Well, I think season. that's very important that we're trying to get well right now is what we're trying to do after spring ball. We had uh, a lot of players that didn't participate in spring and have had injuries, and right now they're working hard conditioning and, and uh, recuperating so that they can be ready to go when we start in August. Who exactly uh, is injured at this point? Oh, golly. Are they major injuries? Oh, there's 14 of them, yes. Oh, oh boy. They were major so that they didn't play any spring ball. But Bob Maggs, our offensive center, who's been a, a tremendous football player for us, missed all of spring with a back uh, injury that he had surgery on back in January. Uh, we had uh, Cooper, our quarter, I mean our fullback, who has been out with, uh, he had surgery on his uh, knee, he had surgery on his wrist, so he missed all of it. Uh, Eric Cumro missed most of, uh, oh, all of the spring practice because of an injury that he sustained in the, in the uh, Citrus Bowl game with uh, BYU. So we've had a lot of players that uh, were out, uh, good players that we missed, especially in the offensive line. They, we were just decimated. And that means that uh, the work is cut out for us on offensive hmm. football. Well, uh, George, it's George Cooper? George Cooper, yes. Mm -hmm. Was he injured during spring practice or outside? Or? No, he injured him. He had a, 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 a cartilage uh, problem all season. In fact, uh, if you remember, we used to have to put it back in place when it, went, when it came out uh, during, during the season. And he had also a wrist injury that they had to operate on. He's been in a cast for about, uh, about 10 weeks now, I think, and, and going to have it on about three more weeks. It's got to give you headaches. What do you do in a situation like this? You're all set and prepared in spring to get them uh, uh, set for the next season. All of a sudden, you lose them. What, what well, does a coach well, do? Well, Larry, it's very difficult uh, to prepare some of them for the coming season. But the, and the important thing, it isn't during the season. When you lose a player like Keith Byers during the season, you, you really cry about that. But on the off season, you just have to wait until they get well so that they can play. It's very unusual for Ohio State to have that many injuries. And it's very unusual that we miss them for all of spring. But uh, we did, the 20 practices that we had, they did miss. And that, uh, that means that we're going to have to make sure that they're in great condition when we start in August. And we hope that none of them gets in, uh, get, would get injured in the month of August and be able to play the whole season. Uh, that's what really hurts a football team, injuries. I mean, you get going in, in, during the season, and, and if you're fortunate, you don't have any injuries. You probably, if you can keep the same team playing, you're probably going to improve and you're going to get better. You lose a couple uh, real good football players, and then all of a sudden your, your efficiency might go down and you might... Uh, uh, not score those touchdowns or stop the opponent the way you should, and, and you might lose a few games. What can you do to stop something? Is, is it a matter of weight training? Is it a matter of maybe artificial turf? What, what causes this? Is it just bad luck? Uh, well, we did have some bad luck uh, uh, when you think of that. Uh, uh, we had some stress fractures that uh, turned out to be a, a, a little uh, more than that. And, uh, what happened is when you get a stress fracture, then it becomes a break, and then you're in trouble. And that's what happened to like a player like Keith Byers. And obviously, uh, you don't want to lose them during that. And I guess the only thing you can do is uh, condition them and see that they get the proper treatment and uh, the rest uh, and see that you don't bring them back too early and see that uh, they're, when they do come back, they're in good shape and good condition because normally what happens is one injury leads to another because they haven't had time to get themselves in good shape to withstand the, uh, the contact uh, of, of football because that's what it is. It's a contact game and injuries do come and uh, you just hope that they're not serious enough to put them out of, uh, uh, of action for very long. Well, you have, uh, I want to talk more about Keith Byers in that situation a little later. I, I want to talk more about what's going to happen next year. You have Corsados as quarterback. Mm -hmm. Jim uh, Corsados, yes. And uh, he, he's had a great year last year. Uh, well, he had uh, uh, one of the truly fine passing uh, seasons for Ohio State football. He was fourth in the country in efficiency. Uh, he had passed for 19 touchdowns. And Which sounds funny, by the way, because eight, eight years ago, when you say somebody's fantastic passer at Ohio State, it wasn't a big thing. Now it is. Well, sure. We've had three good passers in a row. When right. you think of Arch Leister, Mike Tomczak, and Jim Kersadis, we've had passing, uh, and we've got all the passing records at Ohio State right now. And obviously, uh, uh, he has uh, uh, improved, and he's. I think he'll be better this year than he was last year. How about Chris Carter? Uh, is he going to be a major star someday in the NFL? Or 
Well, I, I, he's got two more years at Ohio State, so I'm only worried about those two years, and I right. think he'll have a fine career at Ohio State. In fact, he's cut, uh, he's tied the record in number of touchdown passes uh, so far in two years, what everyone else has taken four to do, he's done in two years. So, And he's, a, he's a, got great hands, and he's got something that not many receivers have. He has uh, a great leaping ability, and the use of his body as a shield in getting the football. He's very good at that. It runs in his family. Apparently, his brother was it Butch Carter or Butch Carter played at basketball. Indiana at ba uh, basketball. Outstanding. In fact, now Butch is the coach at uh, Middletown High School basketball coach. So, uh, I guess you're right. Uh, he is. He was a great athlete, and I think Chris is a great athlete. What about the offensive line? Now you're having problems, uh, injuries there. Is that will the incoming freshmen help that or? Well, we kind of hope that uh, that will happen. That some of the, the incoming freshmen will. Uh, help us uh, and uh, maybe uh, if they don't help us directly they'll be backup people that will push other people to to great heights to to be a good good offensive lineman for us but we have Bob Mags back uh, who I think will be an outstanding center Larry Cotterman at the right tackle position and and a young man that had an outstanding year as a freshman last year for us Jeff Ewan I get the left guard uh, the position that seems open right now is the right guard position and the left tackle position, and there's going to be a fight for that, and uh, that'll be good for us. And we've got Eddie Taggart back uh, at the, the tight end position, so we've got a few positions open. Uh, coming in from uh, our freshman class, uh, well, I think uh, when you look at that, uh, John Peterson from Middletown uh, is an outstanding uh, uh, prospect in the offensive line, as is... Uh, our, our young man coming in from uh, uh, Westerville North, uh, Jeff Davidson, who is right. an outstanding prospect in the offensive line. Situation like uh, Keith Byers is sort of a double-sided uh, sword. On uh, one hand, it was terrible to lose somebody as good as that. The other hand, it gave youngsters more of a, a, a chance to uh, have time playing time. Mm -hmm. uh, will that affect your running attack this year? Well, I think uh, they'll be stronger. Because no, sure. Of it, I think they'll be stronger. Naturally, uh, uh, John Woolridge was injured last year a good bit, uh, and it, re it really had an up and down uh, uh, season for us. He's uh, when he's well, he's an outstanding. Uh, uh, back and and I think uh, he'll be pressed uh, by some of our other backs to to be uh, a top notch uh, running back. Uh, the thing about uh, Keith that was disastrous, Larry, for me, was that he was such an outstanding player. To miss his senior year uh, was was devastating for him. I mean, I, I you, you can understand what our team went through and, and oh, the sure. coaching staff, but think of what that young man went through on the sideline, not being able to play his senior year, and he's such a talented football player. I mean, he can run, he can catch the ball, he can pass, he can break tackles and, and, uh, and elude tacklers like you can't believe. I mean, he's the most oh, I exciting. I saw the he's, the most, game, uh, he's the most exciting <laughs> runner I've ever seen in college football to me. Well, it, it's sort of a shame he didn't get picked uh, number one uh, psychologically, but he was in the first round, so that's... Well, I think there's a lot of things going on because of the injury that he had uh, in the foot. And if it's healed, and, and when it heals, he'll be an outstanding player. I hope that everyone knows that it takes a while to heal a broken bone, and when it's healed, he should play. And if it's not healed, he should wait until it is healed. It's not really a career-threatening threat injury that he had to begin with. It was more of a nagging... Well, I think it takes a while to get over a broken bone, don't you? I mean, I don't sure. think it's a, I don't think it's an easy thing to get well, over. It's not as bad as a cartilage. No, and but I think it's a, I think it takes a, I think in all injuries, I think when you talk about broken bones or you talk about knee injuries or you talk about shoulder injuries, I think it's a year long. What I've seen is it's a year long proposition before it's totally healed. Mike Tomzak was one of the ones that came back so quick. I I can't believe it, but he really wasn't. Uh, a, a total uh, player uh, in his senior year because he of his injury that he got in May. Uh, but he came back and he played well and, and he did a great job for us. But it still takes a while to heal that injury. Do you have regrets maybe about bringing him back? Uh, I'm sure it's maybe gone through your mind that you brought him back too soon or oh, him, he wanted mean, to come back. Uh, you mean Keith? Right. Well, uh, Keith was ready. Keith had an outstanding ball game against Purdue. Right. And uh, for a while, he was getting his feel at uh, Minnesota, and then he, he re-injured himself. And that was a, a real tragedy. I thought he was totally back. And in the bowl game, I've never seen a young man practice like he practiced for the bowl. I thought he'd have an outstanding uh, game against BYU, and then on about the third or fourth play, he 
uh, someone really stamped on his foot or, 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 you know, tramped on his foot and bam, he was out and he couldn't come back. But practice-wise, he really, we even scrimmaged him and he did su such an outstanding job. I thought he was all the way back. People don't realize what a team leader he was also. Well, he was one of our speech. captains, and uh, he worked hard on the football field. He likes the game of football. I mean, and it's, it shows. It shows with the enthusiasm for the game, and he likes to excel uh, in the game. I mean, he has great pride in what he do does. Do you have uh, uh, players, would you consider, in the same category of, uh, of a leader? You had Pepper Johnson that you lost last year. He, mm -hmm. he graduated. Uh, would you say Chris Spielman will fit that role, possibly? Or? Well, I think he will. Uh, I think that uh, we've got to see that. I mean, uh, I think he'll be a great leader at, at Ohio State. I, but I think when you talk about leadership, that comes out during the course of the season and right. when the opponents are there and when they get the opportunity to lead. Uh, he most certainly will be one. Uh, Sonny Gordon is our elected uh, co-captain, and he's been a regular at Ohio State for two years and, 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 a, and one, basically a starter uh, for almost three. So he's well-versed, well-liked uh, by the, 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 the players, uh, well-respected by the players for the efforts he gives on the football field because he's an all out player. He leads by example, and I think that's the great leadership that you're talking about when you talk about Chris Spielman because he shows you that he's a great player and he plays with great intensity. When you look at uh, Jim Kersadis, he's, a, he's one of our leaders and he's that type of player. He leads by example, does it, and, but he also directs. He says, now let's get this done and uh, I think that's important sometimes to say, hey, it's, this has got to happen. We got to do it now. And uh, I think the takeover guy is very important. And he is one. I think Chris Carter is that kind of player because he demonstrates on the field and has the respect of all the players for his great talent. And he sometimes, what he says, he doesn't say much, but what he says, they listen to. On the field, too. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I hear that Chris Spielman has a very uh, different way to approach uh, warming up to the game. Uh, you can't talk to him for about a half an hour before he's in. And a trance well, almost. Yeah. I think that uh, most athletes that are, uh, and I say this, when you look at a, a great wrestler or a great uh, boxer or a great uh, uh, performer of some type, sometimes they do like to withdraw. That's their way of getting up for the game. I don't always agree that that's right uh, in, in my mind, but if that's the way he has to do it to play, that's okay with me as long as he plays when, when the game starts. I can just tell you one story that's, uh, that's outstanding to me is, is the first game that uh, Chris Spielman dressed for. Uh, and at the, just before the half, the score now is 14-3 uh, to three favor of Oregon State. And uh, Chris Spielman hasn't played the first half. And I'm up on the sideline, and someone behind me is stomping around saying, uh, uh, I've got to play, I've got to play. I looked around, and, and I saw this young man with his head down, prancing back and forth, saying, I've got to play. And I tapped uh, Bob Tucker, our defensive coordinator, and I said, Bob, and he said, well, we, we, we were in on defense, and he said, what's the matter? I said, when are we going to play Spielman? He says, coach, he's a freshman. He said, we're behind 14 to 3. You don't want to put him in now. We don't know wh whether he can do it. I don't know whether he's ready. I said, he's ready. <laughs> and uh, I said at halftime, you, uh, Bob, you should play. Uh, Chris Spielman. Well, Chris Spielman made the first 10 tackles of the second half, and we went on to win the ball game. Uh, I think something like 21 to uh, uh, 14. First 10 tackles, second half. First 10 tackles of the second half. He made. I mean, he boom. He was in there. Uh, Just but, think of what happened if you didn't put him in. You, you might have gotten tackled yourself or something. Yeah, that <laughs> might be. <laughs> well, I, 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 I was a little worried about that back <laughs> there right. with a the guy. But I have always. Uh, I've seen players that weren't ready to play, and I've seen some that were ready to play. I thought he was very ready to play, and as a freshman, that's unusual to be ready, that ready to play. Do you give him a specific, uh, almost a regimen before a game? Like, a, a, he has his own thing that he does to warm up and get ready mentally. Do you have a specific thing that you tell the players to do? No, well, we have, as, as a football team, we have a standard uh, operational procedure thing that we go through. I mean, uh, we get up, uh, we're at the motel, uh, we have uh, uh, meetings and taping, and we have uh, uh, brunch, and we have uh, the captain speak at uh, have a uh, team meeting, and then we uh, have little individual meetings and, and chapel, and then we come down to the stadium. 
when we arrive at the stadium and everybody gets dressed uh, in, in a very quiet manner and we kind of get ready. We have a little meeting, so we go out and warm up and uh, uh, everybody gets enough time to get themselves either physically or emotionally ready to play the game. I sometimes think we warm up probably too long, but we, that's the tradition of uh, uh, athletics. We go out approximately an hour and five minutes before kickoff with some people, and everybody warms up for about 25 or 30 minutes, and then we start the football game. And uh, it's a mental and physical football game. I mean, uh, naturally, if you're mentally prepared to play, then... then uh, that's one thing. You've got to be physically prepared to play also. And that if you're not, it's going to be a tough day in that stadium uh, against that opponent because if they're more ready uh, physically and mentally than you are, then uh, you're normally going to pay the price. That's why it's so important that when someone walks in that stadium that they give their best effort all the time. There's no reason not to. When you only play uh, 11 football games. Now, how many times a young man can get totally up is something else, but some seem to prepare themselves more for football games and, and give an all-out performance. That's probably why there's All-Americans. That's probably why there are, are some people that give a... Uh, you have two or three football players that give total effort, 100% effort all the time, every play. And you have two or three that might give, let's say, 75%, two or three that give 50%, two or three that give 25%, two or three might not be giving much effort, you know, and that's, that, it's just like going down on a kickoff. You see so many guys go down on a kickoff, 11 of them, but you see two or three or four players like the Sullivans or, or Glenn Cobb or whoever going down and making the tackles. Do you look for specific character traits when you're recruiting. In other words, can you tell a, 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 um, a Sullivan and a Cobb uh, when he's a senior in high school uh, by his mm -hmm. attitude that he's going to be that type of player? Well, now if you just take the physical thing of, of size, uh, and you can't do that with Glenn Cobb necessarily because he wasn't as big as you'd like to have a linebacker, but he was a hitter. Uh, when you have size and speed, that's one thing. But the other thing is toughness. And if you're talking about an offensive lineman, we look for toughness and intelligence because that normally means they'll stay and they'll work and they'll get the techniques and master all the skills of football. Uh, when you're talking about a linebacker, you want someone that can run and hit. And uh, uh, I always say it's the kind of guy, well, will he go through that wall for us? I mean, will he run his head against that wall? And if he will, I mean, uh, do that, then we're probably going to win. A, a linebacker has so, uh, a different mentality about himself and uh, in, in giving up his body to, for the good of the cause. It's like uh, how many young men do you ever see block a punt? Not many because that takes a lot of courage. Oh, sure. It takes a lot of giving yourself up, and uh, there are people that are very courageous in the game of football, but that's above what you would normally do, you know what I mean? So when you talk about a linebacker, you talk about someone that uh, uh, is playing the offensive line, or you talk about the skill of a wide receiver. Sometimes if you get one that's got the speed and the toughness of a wide receiver, then you're going to get the downfield blocks, you're going to get everything, but you might have a young man that uh, doesn't like the contact phase, but likes to catch the football. Uh, there are a lot of things in, in this, and, and, and you think uh, everyone has courage, but maybe I'm running because I don't want you to tackle me. Now, that's a different right. kind of courage. Sure. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, you know, you don't want to be hit. I mean, that's sure. the idea. Uh, those guys that run into the tacklers uh, are, are one kind, but those kind of elude them is a little different. You know, that's what you're supposed to do. You're not sure. supposed to have a lot of contact. That You're supposed to elude them and put the ball in the end zone. I think that's tremendous. But uh, someone might say, well, he doesn't have the courage. He didn't run through those guys. Well, uh, if he dodges them and puts the ball in the end zone, that's a different type it's of thing. Smarter, that's, smarter. that's his talent. Yeah, right. you're right. We'll be back in 30 seconds. We're here with Or Bruce. You're watching After Hours. Stay tuned. We're back here with uh, Earl Bruce. You're watching After Hours, and we're just talking about intensity and, and what you look for in, in recruits. Uh, how difficult is it to recruit 1986? Uh, there, there have been numerous violations and things like that. Is it tough for you to, com 
to go out against a, somebody who's... No, we're very fortunate, I think. When I look at uh, Ohio, and that's the basis of our recruiting, most of our players come from within the, the realm of the state of Ohio, uh, and I look at our competition, who we have to compete against for the, the top prospects, and we're talking in terms of Penn State, Notre Dame, and Michigan are the teams that we normally have to compete against. And, and they're not breaking any rules. So when they it's don't the break any rules, be lower. We, well, I'm not saying anybody breaks the rules, but those people that are our uh, 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 competition, they don't break the rules. They're they're very good. The the head coaches and and, and every, everybody are uh, above board, above reproach. Uh, they have great integrity, and and I think that helps us. If there were a lot of cheating going on, and they were doing the cheating, I think you'd get caught up in that. That's uh, when you look at what happened down in Texas in the Southwest Conference, for instance. Texas I think you can point to that. Yeah, right. I mean, you're talking about a lot of people. I mean, you're not talking about most of those schools are up now for investigation for big things, but when when there's, we don't run into that in, in Ohio very much. Uh, when you talk about uh, uh, pay to the players, when you talk about cars to the players, so or trips. What exactly is or, a violation for people at home that hear, they hear cheating, that they don't know what, what, what the story is with that? Well, when, when, I, when, well, when I think about cheating, and uh, obviously is, is buying a football player. In other words, I'm paying your way uh, home, I'm giving you some money to play, I'm giving you an automobile, I'm giving you uh, things that you shouldn't get, inducements. Uh, obviously, that's part of it, you know, uh, that's the biggest part of it. And when you uh, do those things, then you get probation, you get uh, expulsion, you get a lot of, a lot of things should happen. Uh, the things that uh, are the minor things, and when I see a list of things of 150 violations, uh, let's say... Uh, Let's say you took your, uh, uh, a player to the airport so that he could go home. One of your coaches took That's a violation. You can't do that you can't because you don't do that for the rest of the student body, so you can't take him. Uh, if, you have so, a yeah. if you have a, a young man out for dinner, uh, that's a violation. Uh, but you, you can't even have one dinner for them? Or? Well, you really can't. I mean, you don't have all the rest of the students out. You know, I mean, there's, there's some problems with all this. Uh, if... Uh, uh, let's just say I heard uh, Barry Switzer the other day on television say, uh, yes, a long time ago, uh, one of his uh, uh, players, uh, the Selmans, who were outstanding players, uh, their father died. They had no way of getting home. He gave them the keys to his car, and they drove his car home. That's a violation. Can't do that. Uh, so but that's going the other direction, though. That's but that's a violation. Overcompensating. See, when, when they say you've got 178 violations and they investigate you, they get all those things and put them down. But when they, and everybody thinks, well, golly, that poor school is getting picked on for little itty-bitty things. But what it really means is that the six violations of buying a car for one, uh, seeing that the parents come to the football game by traveling by air or paying for their way home, those are the violations you're going to get uh, everything, your, your wrist slapped and everything else. But those other violations are things that they, when they come in and investigate you, they find out. So that's the, that's the thing about those violations, I tell you. There's... That rule book is that thick. If you oh, call the NCAA, yeah. and, and, and pardon me for saying that, if you call the NCAA or the Big Ten office and you ask them about a particular rule, they'll say, well, we'll get back to you. They don't, there's no one there that knows the rule book through and through. They've got to look into the cases. So if they they've got look, to they're going to find and, something. And they might interpret it one way one minute and another way the other. That's why we have uh, uh, lawsuits today, you know, many lawsuits against the NCAA, and, the, and there will be probably some against the Big Ten because of, 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 of the rules and how it might be interpreted or, or, or misinterpreted. Well, how do you feel about that? I mean, do you feel we're overcompensating uh, the other direction? I mean, to me, it doesn't seem like a big deal to give a, a guy a, a ride to the airport. I, it doesn't seem like a big deal, but to the NCAA, the that's NCAA a start does. of it. Oh, yeah, that's a start of it. I don't think they'd probably come in and investigate you for one ride to the airport. Several but, things. But so. if there's a lot of things when they found out that you took them to the airport, that's a violation. And you're in trouble. You can't do that. You've got to know that you can't do this as a football coach. And uh, uh, we're always talking about extra benefits. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, if you're a football player and uh, someone offers you a meal at the, uh, uh, for being a football player, you can't take that meal at a restaurant. Uh, that, that's a, that's an ad, a, a, a benefit. If you put your picture on a, uh, if someone says, hey, I want to put your picture on an ad, and you do My that. My time, Zach, with uh, Lazarus, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that was unfortunate. Yeah. It was doing for charity, too. Mm -hmm. Well, he didn't get any money for it, but, I mean, that's still a violation. 
and uh, it, it affected his el eligibility for three months until we appealed it and they li investigated it and then they found out what happened and uh, well the uh, same thing happened out at the bowl game when we had our team picture in the advert uh, they put it in the advertisement of the of the uh, hotel where we were staying well there's a lot of team pictures we didn't give them a team picture we didn't do that but the NCAA got upset about it to me it seems ridiculous I mean, you can go overboard there, there are certain things obviously don't want to give a guy a car and, and, and be blatant about it unless we're going to make them professionals. Uh, well, you, you want, I think anything time you violate, I think that's a particular violation that everyone knows is a violation. What we talked about here, there's, if you title first year coach, he might not know that. A booster might not know that, that that's a violation to give a guy a meal. You know what I mean? But he has got to be told that, and, and the direction is that we can't have any of this. Uh, and it's very difficult because sometimes football players come in and make friends in the community and then pretty soon they're at the dinner and they're doing some things and right. some restaurants are trying to buy them uh, dinners and they, they like them to come around because that attracts a lot of other people. Sure. So you can understand what might happen. Especially in a, in a town, uh, really not such as Columbus anymore, we're not just a uh, college town, but there's an awful lot of pressure monetarily. I mean, Ohio State brings yeah. an awful lot of dollars into Columbus. Yeah, I, but I think the thing that really is, is it, if, if it's set up by the coaching staff, like selling tickets set up by the coaching staff, selling the players tickets, or uh, setting up some place for them to go and eat and, do, and have fun and do things, that, that's what really is a violation, you know what I mean, and when you look at it. And uh, if you once set it up and then it becomes a rollover process that goes on from year to year, you know what I mean? And that's the, that's the violation. I think we all know that. Oh, sure. What, what do you feel about, uh, let's say, Keith Byers, I think I mentioned that uh, maybe the players should be paid a certain fee to, uh, to survive. Uh, again, we're overcompensating. Some of them are, are not getting what they're supposed to. I, I can only tell you this much. I, I mean, you'd have to be talking about, if you were talking about Ohio State where we have 31 sports and you're paying all the athletes, that might be one thing. If you're talking about paying what some people term the revenue producing sports, which are football and basketball at Ohio State in some way, or maybe what, what other team might do, it might be hockey or whoever, it's some sports or wrestling in some areas, then you would give them a, a certain stipulation, a stipend or whatever you want to call it, uh, that would take care of uh, the incidentals. When, I, when scholarships first started out, there was room, board, books, fees, tuitions, and $15 a month for the incidentals, for right. uh, toothpaste and laundry and things of that nature. When probably $15, that was back in the 1940s. Right. If you were to project that now with inflation, that might be $150 a month. I don't know what it would be, but obviously there are some people that believe that that should happen. And I'm sure if I were a player, I'd probably, and, and, and some players have more money than others. And uh, if uh, you're uh, a little bit uh, uh, behind in some of those things, uh, maybe you need that. I don't know. Uh, the, the thing about that is who's to decide who gets it. And, uh, and if you give it to football, what about the other sports? And there's a lot of things in this that would have to be answered that are just as big a problem and headache as it would ever be. Oh, absolutely. You may have a problem now with uh, doling out the money to, to other sports that are like Ohio State. They synchronize swimming. Uh, some other um, uh, sports are not apparently are not going to get... Uh... Well, synchronized swimming. I think all sports at Ohio State uh, are now varsity level with the exception of maybe rifle, and then there are some regional sports or... or uh, or uh, national sports uh, that have been uh, uh, segmented or they look to, to segment them and put them in one uh, area or another. But basically, if they're not a, uh, if they're a varsity sport and receiving scholarship money, then that's one thing. If they would be a club sport without scholarships and, and uh, something else, that's another thing that would come up. Not to dwell on negative stuff, but when you read the paper and, and, and you watch uh, uh, television and, and listen to radio, you hear sensationalist things, the drugs and the, and the cheating, everything like that. It, is it as rampant drugs in college football? Is it, is it just or just a societal phenomena? Well, I mean, you hear the way they make it out. You, you're gonna watch football, and these guys are half uh, crazed out. Every one of them are, is doing something when they're on the field. I just don't. I don't think see that. that's fair at all. I think that basically, I've always found out that the ratio goes something like this: that 95 percent cause you no problems whatsoever. So if you have a team of 100, you've got 95. They're doing everything they're supposed to do. Uh, they're going to class. They're doing their work. They're not getting any trouble. They're not on. They're, they're not there. They're not. But they're just like you would want them to be. 
there are five or five percent, whichever you want to call it, that are in the in the problems. Now, if, if you, you want to dwell on the five percent, which I presume if you uh, wrote about the 95 percent, you wouldn't sell any papers. That's what I'm saying. Because right? they wouldn't want to hear all the good things that those people did. I mean, Mike Lanise is a Rhodes Scholar. I didn't see that thing plastered. No, that's that. what I'm saying. You I mean, see hard all to the find other things that plastered. But, but if a young man uh, gets in trouble after the Michigan football game and gets arrested with 230 other students, the, the football player's name is mentioned. And he might be the only guy that's mentioned. But that's the tragedy of uh, what you pay for, uh, for being the... Uh, uh, the high-profile uh, person and the high-profile uh, sport. Uh, so you want to keep them out of that. But to, to say that we have uh, drugs and, and alcohol running rampage in sports is idiotic. It's not. But there are people, and we're trying to do something about it. I mean, suppose and all the other elements of society would uh, start to do something about it. Suppose we'd start to test other people. Maybe we'd find out. Maybe uh, when you test, uh, they say that uh, if you were to test the doctors and to test the uh, uh, people that fly our airplanes and maybe drive our buses and put those people. You're going to find the same 5% yeah, yeah, there. Save some of those, yes. And maybe more. I don't know. I mean, I'm, who, you can point exactly, the finger someplace. Yeah, sure. Who knows? Well, what do you feel about testing? Uh, uh, will that ever happen in college uh, sports? Oh, well, we test. We you do test, test for two years. Mm -hmm. oh, I didn't even know that. Oh, yeah. We've tested. Uh, uh, for drugs for two years, especially, uh, uh, well, all drugs, but uh, particularly uh, when you talk about the uh, street use drugs of uh, marijuana and cocaine, uh, those are the two, or uh, we don't run into much of uh, anything else, uh, you know, I, don't, I don't think, but uh, we do test for that. And uh, our testing has been a rather complete system. We're not one that announces the test at the first of the season and say, well, we're going to test six weeks later and test, and then we're going to attend yeah, at exactly, the end of the season. Exactly, so they know when. Yeah. We, 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 test, uh, we made some mistakes our first year in testing where we uh, could have, uh, in other words, we could test, and pretty soon we'd maybe be testing you all the time, and pretty soon they'd know maybe that you had come back dirty one time. You know what I mean? Or, and uh, so now we test everybody, and no one knows who is being, uh, 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 when we take the specimen, we, they don't know who's going to be uh, tested and who's not going to be tested. Well, well, it has been an awful lot of pressures on, on a uh, football player uh, uh, going to Ohio State, because he has a high profile, and everybody loves him, mm -hmm. and, and, or her, well, him, right? And uh, there are a lot of things that, that anybody in that situation could get involved in. It's a natural thing. Uh, if somebody does show positive, what do you do? Do you just do you counsel them? Do you? Well, it depends what it is. But uh, in particular, if we were talking about marijuana, we probably uh, the first time say, well, maybe it was uh, one of those social things that happened, and we talk to them, and, and uh, we just tell them, well, we now know that you might have a problem. Now we'll test you all the time. And now the second time, if you become uh, dirty, uh, we'll probably put you on probation, take away some of the things. If the second time it goes a little worse, then boom, you probably won't start, you won't dress, you won't play, you won't make a trip, whatever happens. And then if it would go on, obviously, the idea of drug testing is to help the person. It isn't to punish him by kicking him off the team. It's to say, you got a problem, let's help you, get the counseling, get this, get this straightened out, and we'll go on from here. And you've read about people in professional sports that have great careers, and all of a sudden, drugs or alcohol throws right. them out. They're out of it. In the NBA, uh, the third time or the second time, bam, you're out. So if you're going to throw away your career, I mean, uh, that's one thing. But that isn't our point. Our point is to help them. And if you don't go to the counseling, if you don't uh, clean up your act, then you will be gone. Has it been effective for you so far? Oh, I think drug, drug we, we couldn't go on without drug testing in, in, in college athletics or in athletics right now because I think, it, uh, I think it's the, the idea to help them. I mean, uh, you can't have uh, a person that gets from marijuana to cocaine to whatever, it's just terrible for him, a young person, to get stuck that way. And, and there's high pressures on them. I mean, the one thing that we do when we test, we give them the opportunity to his peer group pressure to say, hey, I can't do this. I'm being tested. Now, before that time, if, if he didn't do it, he was an athlete. He was, you know, he was subjected to a lot of things. Now they say, well, I understand. We hope they say That's that. right. Yeah. I, 
Again, not dwelling on negative things. I I met you at a uh, at a get together, and and I just couldn't help observing somebody walking up to you and saying, "How you doing, Coach? Why are you always nine and three? And I got hysterical. This poor guy. He's a fantastic record every year. He's gone to every bowl. He's he's won most of them, and he has some guy off the street probably every day, every hour asking you about that. What do you say to somebody? Well, I think that's overwritten and overexposed. I think there are a lot of people that understand that 9-3 isn't bad. It's not it's what great. we're all going after. That's right. We're going after 11-0 and 12-0 and, and, and a national title and a Big Ten title, and we've had our share of those. But uh, basically uh, saying that everybody's going for 12-0. and 0. The unfortunate thing about that is that uh, what they say is, uh, how come we can't win the big one? And my question to that is always, who's the big one? We've beaten Michigan, we've beaten Oklahoma, we've beaten BYU, we've beaten uh, uh, teams that have been ranked number one. Uh, who's number one? one team we've, lost to, we've lost to Wisconsin, who's not always the big game, but it, I would say Wisconsin's got to be a big game from now That's on. Right. Don't you? That's right. I mean, uh, so I, I don't know about that. I, I don't think they really think in terms of that. They look back, if they really checked the record and knew what they were talking about, they'd know what the record has been at Ohio State for well, years and years. i give an example. Uh, 65 and 19 at Ohio State. You, you've won uh, the College Football Coach of the Year. Uh, you average 31 points a game in your offense. I mean, that's incredible. And when they, to see somebody come up to you and say, you know, why are you 9 and 3, like, like you know, they're being negative at, uh, about that it was just... Um, well, I think that's conversation, and I think that is. Kick out. I think I think that is a little bit. After a while, it has to annoy you, don't you think? Well, no, it doesn't annoy me anymore because I realize I evaluate people. What's that? But it did annoy you. Well, no, it it, it didn't annoy me that way. But I, I I just it alerts me to I, I put up a thing and says, well, I'm not too sure he has really studied the game of football nationwide or at Ohio State or whatever. I mean, he's talking, Do I? if I could throw out the facts to him, I mean, I could put him in line rather quick, but I've come to the conclusion that a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. So I could talk here for you and, and give you all the facts, and you couldn't throw any back at me, and I could convince you that 9-3 and three might be a good record, and you're still going to say it's a lousy record. Or somebody will say to you, uh, I don't like your play selection, or, or, or you know, you've heard everything. I, 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 somebody off the street, there's like a thousand armchair quarterbacks out there. I, that, that would bother me. Maybe that's, I'm not the coach of Ohio State, but... Well, uh, there's uh, just to hear 75 plays in a game, and I figure there's, uh, if we run, uh, uh, let's say, 10 bad plays and 65 good plays, we've really had a good day against their sure. defense. They might have, if I were looking at the other way, I'd say, hey, their defense wasn't too good against us. So why don't you attack the defensive coaches of that football team? We put 35 points on the board, or, or we put uh, 10 on the board and won 10 to 7. And maybe our offense didn't look good that day, but our defense played exceptional football. The kicking game was pretty good. And if we were so poor at winning 10 to 7, how poor was the other football team? You know what I mean? So I, I, I don't know. I, I, I think everybody can point out, if you're going to go and remember all the bad things, and I can't convert you. You're not going to remember no. the great plays or the good plays or the good runs. What people don't realize that the other team has some good football players too. Now, That's quite I, a few I, other I, teams. I've, I've only coached one place in my whole career, in my mind, that they really uh, looked at the other team, and if the other team played well and had talent, they gave them uh, applauded them. And you know where that was? That was Maslin, Ohio. Maslin, Ohio. When you play, the other team played well, and they had some talented football players, and they gave it all, and sometimes I've seen a great player come up there and play on that field, and that great opponent player get a round of standing applause. Now, I want hmm. to tell you something. That's recognizing good football. Sure. I think that uh, if you're really a fan uh, of football, and I realize you're a fan of Ohio State, and you want Ohio State to win. But if you don't recognize that the other team's got some good players, you're kind of crazy. If you don't see that Easley was a great defensive player for UCLA when he came here, if you don't see that Michigan has some great players, or Ohio State uh, doesn't have some great players, or the great play of uh, the passing of, uh, uh, of uh, Wilson, Mark Wilson, or whoever, uh, golly, that'd be terrible. Well, I sat in the stands and watched his 600-yard uh, 
Was yeah, 621 yards. Yes. I mean, uh, even though it might have been poor defense, that's still a, a marvelous performance by a quarterback. It's, a, it's an NCAA record. But they still didn't win the football game, and the guy that probably <laughs> should, did a heck of a job that day of throwing the football was Arch Leister. I mean, uh, he passed for a good many yards, not 621, no. but over 300. And we won the football game 49 That's the most important part, right. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I don't know. I think that's uh, something that you run into in athletics. I, I think what we dwell on here, too, is that what people dwell on is the fact that what you didn't listen to was some other people come up and say, hey, that guy's all wet. Nine and three is pretty good, and I think we've done well, and the offense has done well. So we, don't, we, we tend to think, well, we, we ignore the uh, majority. But uh, the little segment that, uh, that might be that way, we, we tend to listen to them a little bit. Speaking about listening to them, stadiums full of 88,000 screaming uh, people with Buckeye outfits on, and uh, they're having fun. And uh, it's fourth quarter, you're driving, and it's fourth down and, and two. And you hear everybody yell, go, 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 go. Because I, I have to be honest, I've done that too. Mm -hmm. uh, does it have any effect on you? Do you say, okay, let's give in, let's just try it? Well, fortunately, I've got the headsets on, and I, so don't, you don't, hear, hear that. I don't hear all <laughs> what's going on. But uh, I, I think when you get to a point that that does drive you on, I mean, there's no doubt that you want to do that. It's the, sometimes the good common sense. I mean, it's got to come from the press box. I mean, you can't let emotion take over. It's like you're down in a two-yard line, and uh, the crowd is chanting, and all you have to do is kick a field goal, and you win the football game. Why would you take a chance on fourth and two or whatever when a field goal wins the football game and the guy is 100% from there, you know? And I, I presume if you, if you don't make it, boy, you're really a louse, but it's the percentages that you've got to go with and, and what it takes to win the football game. And I think we all could get caught up in emotion, but good common sense in, 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 in that area has got to come from the press box. They've got to be saying the right things and do the right things. I remember uh, national championship being lost on, on going for two rather than kicking the extra point and tying the football game. And, so with uh, Nebraska? With, uh, well, yeah, that would be, that'd be it. In other words, if I that. tie, we got the national, no one can, I, we win the national title. Whereas if we go for two, we win the football game. But uh, what's more important, the national title or, or whatever? I mean, you know. Of course, the interesting part about that was the press said, kept saying, well, he did the right thing. And it was, it was it, you know, he went for the two and he went to win the game, not to tie it. And then they forgot about him two days later and they talked about the guy who won the national championship. So, uh, mm -hmm. so he lost. No, I voted for Nebraska because I don't think that that should have been decided that way. You know what I mean? When you think about it. Uh, Nebraska led for uh, 12 weeks or, or 13 right. weeks, and uh, and uh, that team lost 28 to nothing the opening ball game of the year, I think, somewhere to to Florida, uh, and you lose 135, 34, or 30 to 29 or whatever they lost it, going for two. That that's a different thing, I think. I think Nebraska should have been the national champion in my own mind. That's but I'm sure other people said, well, Miami won that football game, but uh, it could have been a tie. Oh, absolutely. Which brings up another point. Do you feel there should be uh, some sort of a playoff system uh, compared to just the Rose Bowl? No, I don't. Okay. I uh, like the Rose Bowl. It brings a lot of money to the Big Ten, and I think people want to get into that uh, money. Uh, naturally, the other teams that don't play it, the Pac-10 or the Big Ten, are, uh, split a lot of money for that. Uh, I think if you extend the season uh, and if you pick one, uh, I think that's going to be a problem. Uh, I don't think it's all too bad after the season's over if we've had two undefeated teams and one has voted the national championship, the other one's saying, hey, we were, the, we were as good as that football team. We didn't play, but we, you know, so you got maybe two or three different sections of the country saying we, had to, we have a good football team, too. When you play it off, if it's, if it's really complete and everybody gets an opportunity, that's one thing, but who knows? Uh, who is the national? Suppose one team doesn't get to play. It's still going to be unfair to some people, isn't it? I mean, I don't oh, know. Oh, sure. Uh, I think that's one thing. The other thing is, suppose you did lose that first game uh, of the season, and then you came on as to be the strongest team at the end of the season you possibly be, but that one loss at the beginning of the season puts you out. And the reason you lost might be you had three or four injuries for that football game or something happened, but you don't get into the playoffs because you're not undefeated, and only undefeated teams get into the playoffs. 
I thought when we beat BYU at the, at the uh, Holiday Bowl at the end of the year, even though we lost three games during the season, we were as physical a football team as there was in the country at that time at the end of the season, not during that period when we didn't have a quarterback right. and we had some problems, but uh, when we all started to gel and we get, became more physical at the end of the season uh, I, and we were doing what we should have been doing all along, then that was something else. Talking about the Rose Bowl, why does the Big Ten have a problem, it seems like? Or is it bad luck? It's no, almost like the American the League and the National League playing. No, I'll tell you why the Big Ten has a problem because there's some good football teams out on the coast. That's a good answer. UCLA, USC, Washington are outstanding football teams. In fact, I went to see the spring game of the uh, University of Washington. They have an outstanding football team, and we play them on uh, September 13th out at Washington. And uh, they will be a, a, a really great football team in this country this year. No doubt about it. They've got some great players. Because you always hear the Disneyland syndrome and the players are having too much fun. I, I don't know how much... Well, I, let, me, let me sum that up for you. It is a home game for them out yeah, there, too. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a home game for USC and UCLA, in a sense, but it isn't for anyone else. But the thing that, uh, uh, and I hate to bring this up because it sounds like sour grapes, and I don't mean it that way, but after we lost 20-17 to 17 to USC and we got on the bus and one of the kids said to me as he walked by the bus, I was trying to, he says, I wish we could get them at Ohio Stadium. I said, they don't, play the, they don't play the Rose Bowl at Ohio State. And he says, yeah, but if they ever played there, we'd kick them. You know, and I guess that's a thing that you talk about. Uh, why doesn't they, why, why couldn't they bring it back here and play uh, the Rose Bowl back here? But that's not where it's, what I'm saying is it would be home for, for uh, the Big the Ten, uh, which is a little different going out there all the time. But it's uh, still a tremendous game, tremendous attraction. It's, uh, it, it's, it's such a... Uh, enthusiastic, uh, uh, competitive between two leagues that UCLA crops up and plays like anything in that game. So does U USC. Uh, and, and we get off to a slow start, the, the Big Ten, and that's bad. You've got to get out there and jump on them right away and get a hold of the game, and we haven't done that. It's just been the last 10 years or so, I guess, right, Eric? Well, it goes a little longer than that. A little longer than that. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately. Been, when we first started the, the series, the Big Ten was dominant. Now it's the uh, it's the Pac-10, and, and I, I, it, we're, we're as well-rounded in our league as you can possibly be. We've got great football in our league, and to, if we measure the success by uh, winning the Rose Bowl, that would be wrong a little bit. Uh, uh, that's one game, that's one day, and if we don't play well that day, we don't have a chance. How can you look good? Uh, it's like uh, someone said, boy, Iowa faltered. Well. How can you look good if your best football player fumbles four times and drops a touchdown pass? Uh, uh, obviously, your best football player had a bad day, and, and it was a tra tragedy for, for the University of Iowa. I mean, if anybody had that kind of a day, if, if, if UCLA would have had that day, it would have been a tragedy for them, but they did. Changing direction a little bit, uh, how do you feel about Ohio State breaking the trend for long-term contract with Gary Williams. Is that something I know that you, you've talked about that in the past? Uh, well, I, I, I don't know whether, uh, when you talk about uh, long-term extended contracts or extended contracts, that's been happening in, in uh, uh, football and basketball for some time now. And it's been traditional at Ohio State to have the one-year contract as it has been at some other schools. But uh, since it's changed and there are extended contracts and it helps recruiting, then I think it's very important to have extended contracts. Obviously, it helps the program. Everybody thinks it helps the coach, but the biggest thing it helps is in recruiting and the program. And without it, you've got a negative against you. So I've, I think we've voiced that opinion to uh, uh, because other coaches will, will go against you and say, well, uh, he's only got a one-year contract and, and so on and so forth, and they'll use that. Oh, Is that yeah. what you're saying? Or? Most certainly. The, when it was traditional not to have one, and, and I think uh, the contract uh, really changed uh, all over the country in 1980 when they really started to go to contracts for football coaches and basketball coaches, extended contracts. Before 1980, I, when I, I came here in 79, uh, I didn't think it was very important to have an extended contract because I didn't ask for one. I had an extended contract at Iowa State, but I did not want. I, I knew that they didn't give them at Ohio State, and I was interested in a coaching job at Ohio State. So uh, I came without. Uh, I knew that traditionally Woody Hayes had, had a 28 one-year contracts. Well, that isn't all bad. No, I'm not, I'm not opposed to that. I no, mean, that, that doesn't bother me. 
But as 1980 come around, 1981, when it started to be used against us in recruiting, if you had a good year of recruiting, boy, that hit you hard the next year. And if you had a bad year, they'd try to hit you hard and wipe you out. And recruiting became the biggest thing in the world. You cannot afford to have any negatives in recruiting. None. You've got to have the facilities, you've got to have the education, you've got to have the support, you've got to have the stadium, you've got to have everything. Everything should be boom, 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 boom. And you, and you really accentuate all the good things that you have in recruiting and the positive things. And, but when you go out recruiting, what people that don't recruit, that just sit back and say, well, Ohio State's got everything, they don't know the negatives. The other team knows all the negatives. So when they come in, they hit you and they hit you. And if we're recruiting you, and Penn State comes in and says this, and Michigan comes in and says this, and Michigan State comes in and says right. this, and Notre Dame comes in and says this, that's Plants four kids, negative in their mind. Four, ki four people telling you the same thing to knock you, knock Ohio State out of the box, so that they can, if they knock Ohio State out of the box, they got an opportunity to, to get that young man. So they're all saying and hitting the negatives. So if you were hearing all the three or four or one negatives all the time from, and, and, and we're giving you all the positives, you can understand maybe uh, what kind of evaluation he has to make. Fortunately, no one has really taken a lot of football players out of Ohio, uh, out of Ohio since 1979. I can guarantee you very few impact players have left this state. I could name a few, but I, you, know, you never talk about the big ones that got away. You right. talk about the big the ones, ones that came. Uh, we're running out of time. Uh, Ohio State obviously meant a lot to you to be a coach. Or what, what other, say, dreams would you have for the future? Uh, professional coaching? Uh... No, I, uh, you know, I'm a Buckeye. I'm, I'm a graduate of Ohio State University. I coached for Coach Hayes for six years, and I've been head coach here for seven. Uh, my idea of coaching is at Ohio State. Uh, I think it's very challenging. I think it's, uh, uh, I understand it. Uh, I, uh, when the people aren't interested in winning at Ohio State, I, I'll leave uh, because then I'll be un 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 uninterested in winning, I guess. But I'm very much interested in winning. I want them to be, and I want them to be hyper about it. I want them to, to, to support. I think that's important. And I want them to cheer uh, like they did in the Iowa game. And when we get behind, I want them to cheer even more. Quick prediction, uh, what's going to happen next year? Oh, Five seconds left. well, I think it's going to be a great year for Ohio State. That's an easy one. <laughs> Run for office next time. Okay. Thank you very much for coming down. It's a pleasure, and good luck in next year. Well, Larry, nice talk to you. Coach Bruce, you're watching After Hours. We'll be on Thursday evening at 1130 and Sunday evening at 1130. And stay tuned, and thank you very much. You're welcome.